I'm just gonna pitch you live on an idea, okay? Since you're up on the B game. I'm gonna take a bunch of fruit flies. I'm just gonna grow just a ton of fruit flies. I'm gonna put them in bee costumes. And then I think that they are going to respond really well to Ed Sheeran's X album. And they will shake their bodies at the exact right frequency when they hear maybe like one of the Camilla Cabello, you know, features that they did. They will shake their butts on that flower in exactly the right frequency. Do you invest in this business? Yes or no? On the spot. Your only chance ever, or I'm going to somebody else. I would need to see the data on how they do in blueberries versus raspberries and understand the total capacity and to the extent to which you can attenuate the different shaking of the bee booty towards the, the flower. This is Climate Tech with Kentaro, a podcast featuring the brightest minds and most influential voices in climate tech. I'm your host, Kentaro Kawamori. Today's guest is working on cellular agriculture, bee immunology and nuclear fusion all at once. Wow. You might have guessed that our guest is an investor rather than one of the climate tech company founders we usually have on the show. Mariana Senko is an early stage venture capitalist and the co-founder of Future Ventures. She invests in frontier technologies, which means her investments are on the absolute cutting edge. I mean, this tech is so futuristic that I was able to reference all of my favorite science fiction movies and TV shows in relation to real products. Just a few minutes into this interview, I was wondering if there are any technologies Mariana hasn't had a hand in developing. On the show, we'll dive into some of the most successful startups backed by Future Ventures. I'll pitch a new startup based on fruit flies and tiny bee costumes to Mariana. And we'll even talk about poetry as part of our rapid fire round. The vision in starting the fund is that both of us come from technical backgrounds and feel that we are at our best and highest use as investors when we're looking at companies that are fundamentally changing the course of our capacity to exist sustainably on this planet for ourselves as humans, for all living beings, uh, and for future generations. And we think that a leverage point in that is both human adaptability and our capacity to develop novel technologies that really change the shape of the ways that we can continue existing in harmony on this planet. An example is that, you know, we were facing a global food shortage uh, in the early 1900s. And if it wasn't for the Haber-Bosch process of the creation of ammonia, without which we wouldn't have fertilizer, without which we wouldn't be able to sustain the global population today. And so we think that every time these cliffs of impending doom are coming at humanity, there tends to be a handful of brilliant people who find their way out of those dire circumstances. And what we try to do is seek those people out and give them the resources and the support they need to help those visions become a reality. Wow. Tiny ambition there. Very, very exciting. So you all started this thing in 2018. So you're four years into this. Tell us a little bit about size of the fund. So you're probably on second, third fund at this point. How many portfolio companies do you have? All that sort of good stuff. We've been really fortunate. We're just kind of coming to the end of our second fund and starting off our third fund this coming fall. Each of our main funds is $200 million. The partnership is small in the sense of team, which allows us a particular efficiency. It's just Steve and myself on the investing side. And on on the fund side, in terms of our investments, we we tend to focus on seed, series A companies, writing one to $10 million starting checks, that middle of that bell curve, the three to $6 million range is kind of our sweet spot for checks. And we've been really fortunate in that we've invested in incredible companies so far. We have just shy of 40 portfolio companies across the two funds. And in a couple of cases, we've raised uh, funds specifically to invest in uh, some large follow-on rounds of those uh, portfolio companies. So it's kind of one-time investment vehicles called special purpose vehicles. And so all in, we have about 
just shy of three quarters of a billion dollars under management today which is pretty wild when you consider we didn't start that long ago. But I I think it really speaks to our investors, our limited partners, and the belief they have that supporting these kinds of technologies will make for a better and hopefully more verdant world. Well, that's an an amazing amount of success in a short amount of time. And it's always wonderful to see a woman-led or co-woman-led GP. It's just unbelievable how few of those I know after the literal hundreds of VCs and private equity investors I know. So that's very, very exciting. So fairly large AUM base, pretty large portfolio. Definitely we're going to want to talk about the portfolio a little bit more in depth. But your you know, future is classified as sort of a frontier tech firm. Most listeners are not going to be familiar with what the frontier tech sort of classification or category is sort of by nature, right? It's a less known category. It's incredibly exciting. So maybe tell us in your own words, how do you best describe to people what Frontier Tech is? You know, one of our investment theses is we invest in things that are unlike anything we've seen before, which has the brilliance of we can tell anyone that. And it strikes people's hearts, I think, because when they run into things that are truly novel, that are unlike anything they could have expected, they tend to think of us. And on the flip side, it it has this nice categorization as well, which no one knows what we've seen before. So, you know, you can constantly be sharing that. And there's not a there's not a sense of secrecy about what we're excited about. What what we see as frontier is just beyond the scope of what everyone else thinks is reasonable, but ideally then becomes popularized. So it's hard to say what this is in the future. It's easier to look in the recent past and say, what have been trends that we've maybe caught the tail of? One, for example, is cellular agriculture. So the idea of continuing to eat meat and feed the world's population, but to do so in a manner that is humane, cruelty-free, antibiotic-free, right? So, So cleaner food products that better service both animals and people. And that's a trend where I would say cellular agriculture was not a topic of particular interest. And these days, I think I see dozens and dozens of pitches. Cellular agriculture is a way of producing meat alternatives. These are the animal protein-based products that don't come from livestock. So they have the same cellular makeup as pork or chicken or beef, but they were grown in a lab rather than raised on a farm. This has exciting implications from an environmental perspective, as well as a health perspective. So I think these are the kinds of things we look at, which is how is the world going to be fundamentally different in the future and what technologies propel us there? So there are certain things that are easy to project out. Will we still be burning dinosaur bones in 500 years to fuel our energy sources? Almost certainly not. But what is the transition to get there? So that's, you know, we, we set these long-term visions and then we think about how technology can guide graceful transitions in route to that. I, uh, I think I was mentioning to you earlier, I was just talking with Steve Ellis, who's been on the podcast in the past, and they were, you know, they've been looking at food alternatives, everything from jackfruit protein alternatives to mycelium-based farms. And I recently described this to somebody because I'm a huge science fiction nerd, massive. And it's actually remarkable how much science fiction from the last 50 years has been a path on what we have been achieving technologically. And to your point, part of the next wave of food innovation has to come from alternate protein sources because it's just not sustainable economically, resource-wise to do it. And the best example I always give people is if you've seen the movie Blade Runner 2049, in that beginning scene with Dave Bautista when he's farming maggots and that's his job and sole existence, that's going to be a reality. I mean, people that's just a high quality protein source that's incredibly low footprint activity. It incorporates genetic, chemical engineering. Without a doubt, I look forward to my Big Mac made of maggot stuff in the future. Though I don't think everybody shares that passion. I love your willingness and curiosity about what the shape of that future will look like. I I think food is one that's particularly emotional for people. They respond to it from 
quite literally their gut, right? They have people have a, a visceral and somatic response to the foods that might be proffered for them. We've looked at a lot of insects as alternative proteins. I, I'm with you. I, I think it makes a ton of sense. I, I think depending on the culture you come from, it can be very normalized and, and these things that we perceive as potentially unpalatable can actually be delicacies. And I think we have the capacity to shift our perspectives on those things. But at the same time, you have to ask these questions of just because something sounds in theory like it'll be a good protein, many insects, for example, they have this hard chitin exoskeleton, effectively, right? And and so it's not just about the protein, but the form that it actually comes in and can you extract it and what are the processing costs? And so we spend a lot of time thinking about kind of whole food systems and and how do you take the inception of an alternative protein idea and actually put it in a product that's palatable for people. And uh, similar to what you were mentioning earlier, we're really excited about mushrooms and broadly fungal networks as a whole. We're investors in Better Meat Company, which we think is doing amazing work in the space. But I'm also just deeply curious about how all fungal networks really affect the the health and sustainability of our massively complex ecosystems and how much we can do to kind of bolster their health to better support soil health and the rest of it. Because it's like some crazy percentage of the world's biomass is fungal networks. And we essentially have very little understanding of how they work. Totally. Right? It, it, I think it's just a fascinating space. I'm so curious. It, it feels like that science is really kickstarting. I mean, I'm, I'm sure researchers who've been studying the field for the last 60 years are cringing as I say that. But the the rise of the popular curiosities around these spaces is deeply exciting to me. Absolutely. And in yet another science fiction reference that's uh, on the topic of fungal networks, there was a great couple of Star Trek episodes where they actually, I mean, they took this, you know, to like some super outlandish stuff, but they were actually doing like biomechanical communication systems through fungal networks, which is based pretty loosely on some crazy stuff. But exactly to your point, Fungal networks and spores communicate with each other in ways that very few organisms do. There's a ton left for us to learn there. There's so much left for us to learn. I mean, I've I've taken so many pitches recently on biological computers, um, both people growing tiny brains and trying to turn them into logic gates to people literally trying to make kind of the wetware computational models. And I don't know where these things are going to go. They, they all seem pretty early stage to me, but I love this idea of um, people looking around the world and getting inspired, uh, not just by what exists in nature, but by also human imagination. I'm, like you, a huge fan of science fiction. And I think science fiction, I think the next generation of science fiction writers will propel us even further down these paths, those are the writers that are going to be inspiring the next generation of people to say, oh, yeah, I read about that when I was a kid. Why doesn't it exist? I guess I should go build it. Totally. And that is why I love Frontier Tech. It's a heavy, heavy component of imagination, coupled science with creativity. And what you get out of it is breakthrough stuff once in a while. And that is really the core of how we advance civilization, hopefully for the better, not always for the better. Fingers crossed. That's true. A second order effects are hard to quantify and we should all pause probably and, and be mindful of the fact that by investing in things that we think are better, they could have perverse incentive structures. New positive technology can create unintended negative consequences. That's what Mariana is describing here. But I think you can also get trapped in that logic loop because it's, I've seen so many logic loops around, you know, electric cars are better for people, but then people will feel okay about living further from where they are because their transportation costs are going down. And so net total commute and transport times will actually increase. And so then we'll build more further. Right? You can make these arguments about why any potential solution is actually detrimental, but I think some of those are kind of dead branches of reasoning because you, you can kind of logic your way into and out of any belief system. And at some point you just have to say, okay, but to make real long-term progress, we need to start somewhere. And that needs to be a shift towards electrification, for example. 
Totally. And I, and I think that thinking pattern and behavior is probably exemplified by VCs probably more so than anywhere, right? Where there's a huge component of being a VC investor that involves the gut. And if your gut is telling you something's off here, then your brain starts connecting that and starts really overemphasizing what could go wrong here versus what could go right here, right? That's sort of the classic thing many venture investors have to learn along the way is if you're overly focused on the stuff that could go wrong, you will miss the big ones every single time. Absolutely. And that's why it becomes hard for many people, particularly people with technical backgrounds. I did a fair amount of work in my academic time in and around robotics. And so it became very, very hard to be a robotics investor, particularly early in my investing career, because I mostly just saw all of the things that were wildly difficult and that I thought were intractable. And you just end up in a in a thesis of um, perfection becomes the enemy of function. And, you know, you just have to accept that everything is iterative, particularly the development of technologies. Totally. And the uh, end zone isn't necessarily always where we think it is. That's sort of the, the nature of innovation. That was maybe one of the very, very, very few football references you'll ever hear on the podcast. I'm not a, I'm a soccer guy, not a football. My definition of football is different. <laughs> well, maybe that's a good pivot. You know, you mentioned studying robotics in school. Tell us a little bit about your backgrounds. You know, obviously robotics is a part of that, but, you know, where are you from? How'd you come down this path? All that good stuff. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep it short. I'm originally from Ukraine, from Western Ukraine, and my parents uh, and I left the country in the early 90s. Essentially, they they were fearful that the demise of the Soviet Union would not be peaceful, uh, which surprisingly it was, but essentially what's happening there now was something they were fearful of then. I'm deeply grateful for the path they took. They're both engineers and absolutely brilliant and they essentially requested of me to become anything but an engineer, which they thought were was just necessary but undervalued. Uh, so that's exactly the direction I went in. But they were both mechanical engineers. And so I, I, in turn, wanted to study the world from a perspective that wasn't discernible just by looking at it um, through your own natural senses. And so I, I studied a mix of material science and biomedical engineering because I felt that I had no intuition for how things worked on atomic or cellular levels. And that led me down the path of robotics. I was particularly interested in biomimetic materials, so materials that either were born of biological systems or tried to mimic them in particular ways, and then using that as a means of control and uh, mobility uh, within within the field of robotics basically how can how can we look at biology to inspire the robots that we might build in the future really really interesting awesome cocktail conversation kind of research but I think I quickly realized that it was just a little bit beyond what was going to kind of easily come into being at the time that I was studying in school and so I realized that I really love tangible things and and became very curious about what were the technologies at the kinds of maturities that they could really start affecting our world. Um, I'm an only child and I'm not very patient. And so I just, uh, I was most interested in things that were going to have effects that were discernible to me within my lifetime. And uh, I just a generalist, I suppose, in many ways. And that really led me to this field of investing where I feel so fortunate that I get to explore across across these boundaries in so many different sectors. There's a little bit of uh, irony there that you're a self-described not so patient person investing in frontier tech, which by nature takes a very long time to come to fruition. <laughs> it's right. And our funds are 15-year funds. So they're a little bit longer than your average because I think we understand the pace of this innovation. I feel like a rudimentary explanation of investment funds and venture capital is important before we move on. A typical VC fund is structured in a 10-year cycle with a one to two-year extension period. That means the VC group will invest all of its capital during that time period and start to see profit. Future ventures investments are earlier stage, so they take longer to come to fruition. That's why their cycles are longer. But I think it bears mentioning that we do really focus on things that are that are going to come into being in the next decade or two 
you know, there are the kinds of research projects that I was involved with early in my career are many, many decade projects. I have such deep respect for people who can work in those fields. Um, that's really the basic science fields. What we're interested in is that translation layer between starting to understand how those basic sciences work and actually translating them into functional engineering problems. Yeah, I was going to ask you about the fun cycle. So 15 years makes a lot of sense. Is there an extension period to that too, that you guys built kind of typical, as you would see, one to two year and a 10 year fund? That's right. And we'll see where, you know, just four years past uh, kind of into the start of fund one. And we've already been fortunate enough to have two companies um, go public. And so hopefully those kinds of trends continue and they'll allow us to support potentially the longer tail companies to the extent that they need. But I think a real risk and potential commentary on our funds is that we're probably at risk of being early more so than being wrong. So Steve uh, was an early investor in D-Wave, a quantum computing company, And I think he was on the board for 17 years. And then a number of years after that, the company actually just a couple of weeks ago went public. And so I think it was a brilliant investment in many ways. And and one could also make the argument that that one was probably maybe an early bet given the cycle that is expected of us. Certainly know all about that. Uh, Our area in carbon accounting had multiple iterations where people were just too early. So let's talk a little bit about the portfolio. So you had you just mentioned a couple of companies that went public. D Wave was one of them in the quantum space. What was the other one? So D Wave was not an investment from Future Ventures. It was an investment Steve made at a a fund that he was formerly a member of. Got it. Our two companies that went public were Atai Life Sciences, which is a uh, focused on psychedelics for mental health uh, therapeutics, and uh, Sensei Biotherapeutics. That's a definitely a uh, very hot topic on Wall Street right now. I'm hearing about that all over the place. And when I recently was visiting a uh, friend and he busted out a psychedelic mushroom chocolate bar because there's a few municipalities that have legalized that. I was like, wow, it is, this, is, this is happening. This is pretty cool. Yeah, it's really shifted. I think one of the world's largest rising epidemics is uh, mental health. Uh, suicide rates are particularly in at-risk populations. They have only gone up, Some, in some cases have doubled in just the last couple of years. And so people understanding that the therapies that have been enacted today, which have mostly been to alleviate some form of the symptoms of depression as opposed to being truly curative. And it appears that certain forms of psychedelics in the right set and setting, you know, with with all of the caveats of um, used appropriately with with professional guidance can be curative. And that is such a potentially profound shift for the future of humanity and something we're really excited about and in particular excited about helping um, veteran populations come to more accessible forms of treatment for their PTSD. Uh, One of the things that just saddens me more than anything is the concept that so many soldiers in the U.S. come back with uh, severe challenges and and mental health conditions uh, that are born of the environments that we put them in in favor of them supporting our rights to continue being America. And then they often have to leave uh, the U.S. and go down to Mexico or Peru or Brazil to seek treatment. And that feels so incongruous to me. So I am, I'm really supportive of understanding how to take these, these patient populations and really give them the support and take away the stigmas that have been surrounding some of these topics. Yeah, I agree. It's a, uh, it was such a hot topic in like the mid to late aughts where of course the first wave of veterans were coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan and really experiencing heavy PTSD and I don't know if you remember that, but there was a lot of talk about kind of that, that frontier of using psychedelics and microdosing in treatment plans. And today is so much different on that. And it kind of went away for like 10 years. It's only come back recently that people are really talking about it again. Exactly. And it's, it's you know, you know what didn't go away is the people who have need of yes. it. Yes. And- well, they've increased exponentially, I would exactly, say. Exactly. Exactly. And, and so I, I think it's just a sector we we care deeply about. And also, interestingly, a sector where we made investments and we're so excited to see the number of companies that are 
coming into the space now, but we've actually moved away in our own investment thesis. I don't know that we will have many more uh, psychedelic focused investment companies, uh, potentially if we see something really novel. But I think that's also a key part of our portfolio is that we're we're always moving on to the next sectors of interest for us. Yeah. And I think this is so at the heart of climate, right? People are talking about like the topic du jour for some time has now been social justice and the intersection of, of climate. But I mean, I think we're going to see a, a, a massive issue really on the mental health front. I had the chance to see Lori Santos, who was sort of referred to as the happiness professor at Yale. She's quite renowned on that subject and blew my mind when she pulled up the talk, the statistics during this talk of something like 40 plus percent of current Gen Z or the whatever the one coming up behind Gen Z is depressed or experiencing some form of depression. And of course, it's because of f- social media. But if you combine that with what is going to be significantly worsening effects of climate change, it is going to get a shit ton worse before it gets better. We're going to have a lot of people in a lot of pain, in a lot of trouble, and mental health is still massively stigmatized. And climate change is going to cause, if it's not already caused, in a mental health epidemic. So it's, it's right. good to and hear. I think people could say, guys, why are you talking about mental health on a climate podcast? And I would say because the two are inextricably linked. Uh, and you're never going to motivate people to figure out how to live in greater in, with a greater sense of reciprocity for our world and appreciation of it if they don't feel a desire to exist. And so I, I just I I cannot decouple these two things in my mind. Totally, and I, I mean I firmly believe you're talking about the second order effects earlier, right? Social media is a part of this problem. It's by nature, our media engines, whether it's social or the news engines, love these headlines because they generate clicks. And then these clicks create all sorts of second order effects, which are devastating. I think that while social media, we we like to damn it as the root of all modern evils. I also think that our capacity to be connected in near immediacy across borders, cultures, ages, races, right? Like, yes, we we live in these increasingly small algorithm guided bubbles, but there are capacities to break beyond that. And I think appreciation for planet, for the planet, for nature, for the outdoors is one of those things that cross those boundaries and is a means through which people can find each other, despite maybe being in very different social bubbles. And I'm very excited about that. We're investors in a company called Earthshot Labs, which is trying to figure out how to shift the economics around carbon credits and uh, global reforestry practices and enable more of the economic value to flow back to local communities. And there has to be a social media strategy around that, right? Like the, that's, that's how you get these grassroots movements moving these days and, and for people to actually feel a sense of empowerment is guided through their capacity to share about how their own progress is going. And I, I don't think we use these tools for their potential benefits as much as we possibly could. No doubt about that. I admire your optimism on the topic. This is generally the podcast of optimism. I cannot tell you how much I loathe social media and the imbalance of the positive to negative, but I'm glad you're staying focused on the bright side. Stay a little bit more balanced there. Good. All right. So let's get away from social media. I've got to, I've got to run for the hills. I have damned Facebook enough on this podcast. I'm probably on like the Zuckerberg hit list at this point. I, I can't step foot within uh, with 15 miles of the Facebook campus or bad things happen. The drones come out. God, I just keep making it worse. Yeah, I, I mean, they're gonna, you're gonna find me buried in a swamp somewhere at some point. Well, if you're loud enough, they can't disappear you that easily. So it's also a strategy. True, true. Maybe I should get louder on a Facebook account. I don't have one, so maybe I'll create one and just really poke the bear. <laughs> oh God, I don't think anybody wants to see that. All right, okay, so we just covered a couple of the portfolio. Tell us about, you know, those were really on sort of the end part of their venture life cycle going into public markets. Tell us, tell, give us a couple of examples, maybe of some recent ones or, or, or really notable ones you think uh, you know, aren't talked about as much because they're in more complex topics or just ones that haven't really entered the mainstream yet. 
Yeah. Oh, wow. They're all so interesting and exciting to me. I'll just touch base on a couple of them. B-Flow is a company that we invested in one of their earliest rounds. And what they've been focusing on is bolstering the immune systems of bees, of the insects that pollinate our foods. The vast majority of the world's foods are still insect pollinated. And as people may or may not have heard, there we have a global bee crisis on our hands. The colony hive collapse is a problem almost um, in almost every part of the world. And when we talk about the unit economics for farmers and farmers increasingly being in kind of an economically unsustainable profession for themselves and for future generations, probably one of the largest leverage points that you can have is in the initial pollination of the plant, right? You you can never grow more plants than you start with pollinated. And so if your pollinators aren't working to their best and highest capacities, you're never going to grow more, more food later at some point in the process. So we have all of these um, practices in farming that come later down the line around weeding and pesticides, but almost nothing to actually fundamentally shift the starting point. And so B-Flow is a series of technologies, both in the food and the tracking and actually helping train bees to focus. Bees tend to be a bit promiscuous and uh, will essentially just pollinate anything nearby. And so if you're a blueberry farmer, you'd really like your bees to be pretty focused on blueberries. And they actually have technologies that help enable that. And what's wild, just this is so mind blowing to me, is that they've seen 50 to 60 percent yield increases in the fields that are using bee flow technology products with with their pollinator colonies. And those are, you know, yield increases you don't hear of in agriculture. I think that that's um, potentially a, a huge global shift that's coming. Commonwealth Fusion Systems is maybe another interesting one to touch point on. Um, so it's a nuclear fusion company. And I state that with, you know, it, your audience is a safe space to call that. When when we talk about this company uh, more broadly, we really talk about uh, clean energy and fusion energy because uh, for lots of reasons, the world's global population is very cautious and trepidatious around the word nuclear. I think that's unfortunate, but I think it's a reality. And so we want to distinguish here the difference between fusion and fission. Fusion is the smashing together of atoms and fission is the act of splitting them. Right now, nuclear energy is produced through fission. Fusion is what fuels the sun and other stars. Mariana is saying there's hope fusion could be scalable on Earth in the next decade or two. And that would be a game changer for producing clean energy. And so what Commonwealth Fusion is doing, you can think about is, is building tiny suns and using these new types of magnets that they've generated to help contain that energy in a safe, uh, repeatable manner. These things, you know, you can shut off very safely. They, they don't generate waste uh, in the same ways. And they've, they've really gone down this path of, of really taking proven science and shifting the economics around how to build these plants and, and something we're really excited about. Now, there are lots of fusion companies out there and some are innovating on fundamental physics and some are innovating on engineering of known physics and that the Commonwealth is very much in the later practice. But we think this is, this is a space that um, we're so excited about the number of fusion and fission companies that are coming into being and they each have different challenges associated with them. We as a fund generally are concerned about taking on too much regulatory risk because that's hard to time. And so that's why we're excited about a company like Commonwealth, whose technology is provably safe and who have made such spectacular progress in the last couple of years. And so they've raised a they raised a $1.8 billion Series B which is quite spectacular from a number of investors who have also been on your podcast over the last couple of years. And so delighted to be working with all of those people and seeing, um, seeing their first uh, plants come into being. We should, we should see fusion plants coming online, producing net positive energy by 2025, which 
would probably be the most profound shift in terms of global energy systems that we could possibly imagine. Yeah, no doubt. I'm glad you picked those two. And I think the fusion innovation and breakthrough, once it's scalable and commercial ready, that is literally the future in every sense of the word, right? I mean, I firmly believe that is the breakthrough that makes humanity a spacefaring species in many ways, right? It'll elongate lifespans. It'll do all kinds of crazy stuff. It's going to be amazing. Truly one of my uh, favorite areas I've gotten to get deep into over the last few months. Bees is, I love that space. I was glad to hear you mention that one first. I've been following that since the early days when people started really deploying capital into it. It's a fun one for me because I grew up in a very agricultural area in Germany. And so some of my greatest memories is, is just being out in nature in the fields. And the bees are such a key part of that. There's, just, there's something so romantic about the bees doing their job in the circle of life as they speak. Cue the uh, Lion King music, which we definitely cannot afford. <laughs> F- Disney and their and their licensing costs. I love that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the thing, you know, as a roboticist, there was definitely a part of my research path that said, "Oh, well, you know, what if we, what if we made little robotic bees?" And people are working on it. But what's interesting is we don't actually fully understand the full connection between a bee and a plant. There, there are actually micro movements in the way in which the bee flaps its wings that change how the flower reacts, right? So there's these, it's not as simple as a bee landing on a flower and having some fuzz on its body. That will also work, but I think we need to lend credit to nature here who has just developed this gorgeous system, which has so many subtleties in it. And so what if, what if our first source of action was further supporting and strengthening the systems that are already working for us. Totally. And uh, I'm just going to pitch you live on an idea, okay? Since you're up on the B game. We're going to take a bunch of fruit flies. I'm just going to grow just a ton of fruit flies. We're going to put them in bee costumes. And then I think that they are going to respond really well to Ed Sheeran's X album. And they will shake their bodies at the exact right frequency when they hear maybe like one of the Camilla Cabello like, you know, features that they did. I forget what that song was called. Maybe Shivers. I think we play Shivers to a bunch of fruit flies in bee costumes. They will shake their butts on that flower in exactly the right frequency. Do you invest in this business? Yes or no? On the spot. Your only chance ever or I'm going to somebody else. I would need to see the data on how they do in blueberries versus raspberries and understand the total capacity and and to the extent to which you can attenuate the different shaking of the bee booty towards the the flower it's easy it's uh, i don't even have to it's not uh, it's just different songs uh, the blueberries it's generally is a mariah carey soundtrack raspberries ed sheeran uh, i get it yeah the, the high notes yeah, mariah yeah. carey really like a- exactly that eighth octave done it's over the, the, Sounds like a yes to me. Uh, I I think the the challenge at the end of the day is that the fruit flies just don't live very long, and so you won't even get through a full growing cycle. So I, I think your unit economics maybe require a little bit of pushing on. But they're super fruit flies. See, you're just focusing too much on the what's not possible. I mean, <laughs> maybe I forgot to tell you they were super fruit flies. Ah, uh, you did forget. Yeah, that was that was a yeah, key yeah. part of your your innovation. You should really celebrate your technological innovations we should open with those i yes that's right maybe i should stay in my software lane and not get into the fruit fly game it was worth a shot i mean i had you here i had to try fun fact that's how i've raised all of the money for persephone i just come in just say some crazy shit that has nothing to do with our business and then people give us money it's that easy it people works, right I mean, yeah no good. yeah if you're, if you're compelling and confident enough and and you, you know, you've got a, a whole seamstress factory ser- selling the little bee suits, then sure, who would it, it was It was literally that exact pitch. And then after the fact, I just tell them, oh, actually, we have this better business idea. It's carbon accounting software. Don't worry about it. We'll, we'll still return your capital for you. It's fine. Don't ask. Don't ask, don't tell. I mean, so much of investing is the recognition that sufficiently motivated and brilliant people will figure out a path forward through the labyrinth of chaos that is running a startup and so you are as much investing in the idea as the capacity of the person to think on their feet and respond to the realities 
Okay, pausing here for a disclaimer to say that much to my disappointment, Persephone is not actually selling tiny bee costumes. It's also time for our rapid fire rounds. Normally, based on our recent episodes, I wouldn't say it was rapid, but Mariana and I did manage to go back and forth a bit faster than usual. All right, what advice do you have for the next generation of folks wanting to get into climate tech, VC specifically, since obviously that is where you're sitting today? Start with a, a background of a unique skill set that you have, uh, and you can grow from there. So if you are curious and engineering minded, go get an engineering degree, deeply understand these spaces, uh, go deep on something first, and then grow from there. Excellent. What is your favorite place to travel or vacation to? I generally love playing in the outdoors and we've recently gotten more and more into surfing. So currently uh, surfing in, in Costa Rica was, was a really spectacular experience and I'm so excited to go back. Wow, that sounds fun. And when you say we, who are you referring to there? Uh, my husband and I. That's awesome. Who's better? You Did you outsurf him or did he outsurf you? Uh, we gratefully practice slightly different styles. So I'm a long boarder. He, he's more of a mid-length short boarder. So we, we can cheer each other on. And it's great because I'm, I'm goofy footed, which means uh, my left foot's back. Uh, he's regular. His right foot's back. So we, we can share waves and, and don't, don't get in too much competition with each other. Sounds like a blast. I've not been to Costa Rica. It's high on my list to get to. All right. What are you currently reading? What book specifically? I mean, I, I tend to read like six books at a time. Ah, you're one of those. Which uh -huh. is um, maybe not a kindness to anyone, particularly as I'm trying to talk my way through them. But uh, maybe I'll mention that the, the book that I am constantly reading and probably will be reading for the rest of my life is the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu. I just, I find that there is no point of my life or no moment in which it does not have relevant things to teach me. That's a great one. It's sort of like Siddhartha or the five rings for me. Just always good to come back to. On the same topic, I think you just named one, but uh, what are three books that are in your all-time favorites? And you can count that one as one of them. <laughs> the Jorge Luis Borges wrote short stories and so maybe this is cheating but his collection of short stories uh fiction s i think has some of the most brilliant thoughtful curious commentary on the human condition in all sorts of weird and surreal realities oh man i i love books so much that it's really hard for me um this is one that is kind of like a reference book for me but Alan Fletcher is a designer and published his journals at some point called The Art of Looking Sideways. And I think it's it's a beautiful tome on design thinking and playfulness in particular. And I think the last one is a little bit of a weird one. And I would say there's always a rotating book for me in here, but it's just what I've been thinking of lately. Um, we're currently architecting and designing a home. And so I've been thinking a lot about how the spaces we inhabit and live in actually define the shape of our lives. And there's a brilliant book called uh, A Pattern Language, which is a, a treatise on, on design thinking. And it's probably not a book that anyone could have written today because it's extremely prescriptive. I promised Mariana I'd add additional information so our listeners can look the book up. It's by Christopher Alexander, Sarah Ishikawa, and Murray Silverstein. And I don't agree with a lot of it, but I agree with the style of the thinking. I uh, love that you referenced that. If you have not really delved into the topic of design thinking, I couldn't recommend it more, especially if you are a creator. It's a good sort of framework and skill set to build. Excellent. Those were awesome. What advice would you give to your 20-year-old self? Breathe. <laughs> I, I admit this probably has to do with an immigrant background, but I probably spent the vast majority of my teenage years and 20s um, in a mild panic of trying to get to places of stability to ensure that I would be okay that I would be in a position that I could support my parents later in their lives. 
And I'm very grateful to have landed in a space where I feel that those things are true. But I think that there were experiences and opportunities and ways of engaging in the world that I was too stressed out to truly appreciate. And I think those were only costs for me at the time. So I would say, relax, you're going to work hard anyways. You, you, can, you can stand to you know, stop holding your breath for a minute. Good advice and uh, one that'll resonate with basically everybody that comes from an immigrant family. You know, for us, it's certainly all sides of our family. And yeah, it's a, it, there's pressures of coming from one type of environment into the American dream and what that means for folks that sacrifice and what's ahead. So definitely resonates. Last one. What is your superpower? I think my superpower is an odd one in that I have a reasonable intuition for understanding that in Congress space, when, when someone is saying something, but they're feeling maybe at odds with that. Uh, and the counter to that is I read a, the, or I suppose the added to that is I, I read a lot of poetry and I'm generally good at finding the right poem for a person in that moment and just sending it off to them and saying, and just, you know, without a lot of commentary and just saying, here's a beautiful poem by a beautiful poet. And then I'll, I'll often get a message back later. They're like, how did you know? <laughs> uh, and I think the reality is that the breadth of the human experience can feel very personal and often very lonely and unique to your circumstances. And I think a beautiful thing about literature is that some amazing and eloquent minds have spoken about it in the past and that you're generally not alone. Very eloquently put. You'll have to, uh, maybe you can send me a congratulatory poem on the successful pitch that I made to you earlier. I'd be keen to receive that. But wow, that is a super unique answer. Where do you source your poems? I mean, is there, do you have a set of authors or just from all the poetry you're reading, you've got a wide breadth to choose from? I think I have a wide breadth to choose from. And to anyone who doesn't like poetry very much, I would offer go read and poetry anthologies because uh, no one poet save Mary, maybe Mary Oliver, wrote such consistently brilliant poetry that it is uh, compelling to read all of it as a body of work. So anthologies are the way to go. Yeah. And if you think you don't like poetry, then listen to some Tupac Shakur or Kendrick Lamar. I mean, yeah, the, def the definition of that is often misunderstood, as That's you right. point out. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I think uh, the capacity of spoken word in particular to bypass the prefrontal cortex and hit you straight in the body and the being can help us all make a lot of sense of some of the things that otherwise feel really intractable. Yeah, I mean, if, if wow, if, it, if poetry is that, then this podcast is like a slap in the face and a rude awakening uh, whenever I'm on the mic. So I am glad to have you on to bring some balance to it. Look, this has been enormously fun. I'm super happy to have had you on, learned a ton. Definitely love to have you back in the future. We can nerd out more on bees and uh, fusion. Those would be maybe some good deep dives. Let's do it. Such fun. Thank you so much for the time. Make sure to check out Mariana Senko and her work at Future Ventures. Links are in our show notes. Well, guys, Climate Tech with Kentaro's sophomore run has come to a close. I'd like to say we covered even more ground this season, from space computers to pangolins. Oh, and we also covered Climate Tech. That one was fun, too. There is so much more to unravel, and we will bring those all to you and more in our next season, so please stay tuned. I urge you to subscribe to our podcast so you get notified when an episode drops. Also, follow Persephone on LinkedIn and subscribe to our weekly newsletter. And just like The Mandalorian, we will be back with a new season. Climate Tech with Kentaro is produced by our incredible team at Persephone and Human Group Media. Our theme music is by Guest House. And if you want to learn more about Persephone and our climate management and accounting platform, please visit our website at persephone.com. Persephone.com